Today, I would like to honor one of the most beloved fairy tales of our time, or, more specifically, one particular version of this fairy tale which does an excellent job of retelling it. Beauty and the Beast. Bonjour! 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 No, not that version. Or that version. Or even that version. In fact, one reason I'm so desperate to talk about this film is because of how popular the 1991 Disney film is. For most people, the Disney film is the first thing they associate with the title, Beauty and the Beast. But, in my opinion, I believe not only that the old black and white French version is better, but that fans of the Disney film who weren't aware of it may come to like this version as well, because what makes it better isn't the fact that it's older, or the fact that it's French, or the fact that it's black and white. Sure, it is artsy, but that's not why it stands out. Rather, it is the film's spellbinding beauty, its raw power and mystery, and its dreamlike storytelling overflowing with rich emotion, merging the magical and the mythological with the techniques of contemporary surrealism. It is a dream constructed by the deep desires of the mind, painted on the canvas of the heart with the colors of joy, sadness, love, lust, and most importantly, wonder. For these reasons, Jean Cocteau's 1946 Beauty and the Beast not only holds its own against the fairy tale's more modern adaptations, but it's also good enough on its own to qualify as an essential film. First, let's start with what I think Cocteau's version does better than the Disney version. But before I do that, I do have to give credit where credit is due. The 1991 film is beautifully animated, with charming characters and amazing catchy songs all the way through. It is a masterful film worthy of all of the acclaim it's received, and it has received so much acclaim. After all, it was the first animated film to receive an Academy Award nomination for Best Picture. The only reason I don't rank it as highly as its more obscure predecessor is because of two small areas where I think it falls short. First, the central relationship between Belle and the Beast, and second, the plot holes in the construction of the world of the story and the magic of that world. I'll let Daniel O'Brien of Crack.com explain. And be our guest, there's a hundred fucking dancing forks and spoons and knives and cups. A, how many staff members does this castle actually have slash need? B, where are the real plates in this world? C, is Belle then eating off people's faces? She dipping a face into a face and then eating it? What about the toilet? Was the toilet man? Was toilet always man? Was toilet once man and is now toilet man-made toilet? Uh, hey, how does the broom and the candle have sex with each other? And Chip, he's eight. Mrs. Potts is a fucking hundred. He calls her mama. That's, there's a story there, Mrs. Potts. And America wants to know, are they still getting fresh food delivered? It looks like they are. Is someone supplying them with fresh food? And that's not weird for anyone? They're, where's, what's the gray stuff, Lumiere, that you're getting supplied? The gray stuff that's delicious. What's the story there? There's plenty more to nitpick, but long story short, it's a complicated story, which leaves both children and adults with a lot of troubling questions to unpack afterwards. Yes, the 1946 version shares a lot of the same elements and has a few plot holes of its own, but its surreal dreamlike tone enables it to employ dreamlike logic, which excuses some of the more disorienting parts of the film. But more importantly, the 1946 version does have a lot of small things that I think make it more fun and interesting than the Disney film. A magic mirror that can not only show you people who are far away, but can also show you your inner self, treasure that turns into garbage when held in the wrong hands, a glove that allows you to teleport, and two annoying sisters that all kinds of magical mischief happens to. Of course, I won't reveal every surprise, but basically there are a lot of imaginative and unique elements to this film, each of which only make it more endearing. Most importantly, though, the 1946 version does a better job with their romance. Yes, people like to call out Disney's Beauty and the Beast as an example of Stockholm Syndrome, and no, it does not count for various reasons, namely because Belle is a prisoner by choice. Still, though, since this story is essentially about a relationship between a captor and a prisoner, it will always be inherently problematic, and any film adaptation will have a very difficult time diminishing those problematic elements and convincing the audience to root for the relationship. However, Belle seems like much less of a prisoner in the French version, mainly because while the beast in the Disney film is aggressive, dominant, and borderline abusive, then go ahead and starve! If she doesn't eat with me, then she doesn't eat at all. This beast is kind and permissive from the start, although admittedly awkward and creepy. Acceptez-vous que je vous vois souper. Thus we arrive at the main difference between the two films. 
the Disney version makes the beast a dynamic character, transformed into a beast so that his beastly outsides will reflect his beastly behavior, thus tasking Belle with not only breaking the curse, but also molding him into a nicer person. In the French version, on the other hand, the beast has been cursed by simple misfortune. Mes parents ne croyaient pas aux fées, elles les ont punies en ma personne. Je ne pouvais être sauvé que par un regard d'amour. He begins the film as warm-hearted on the inside, and Bell's challenge is to see that, and to reconcile it with his repulsive appearance. This dynamic is further complicated by the character of Avenant, the predecessor and counterpart to the character of Gaston in the Disney film. Gaston is a well-crafted character, in that, though he is exaggerated, he does a good job of representing not only the dangers of toxic masculinity, but also how accepted and supported it is by the community that sides with him. The enemy in the Disney version is not merely violence, but violent conformity. Conformity that rallies around people like Gaston, and attacks and victimizes others. However, Avenant is a more interesting character to me, because he's more of an antagonist than a villain. Though he is definitely a jerk, he's not evil. At times, he's even shown to be sensitive and poetic. Il faut que je vous réveille de ce cauchemar. Il faut que je vous emporte. Je sais à quoi vous pensez. Je suis un schnappan. Auprès de vous, je travaillerai. Nous quitterons la ville et les tavernes. Vous n'êtes pas faite pour être une servante. Même le parquet veut devenir votre miroir. His love for Belle is legitimate, and, surprisingly, not entirely unreciprocated. This not only makes him more three-dimensional, but adds more drama to the story, by making him a serious contender for Belle's affections. On one hand, she is faced with a nice man with a beastly appearance. On the other hand, a beautiful man who's kind of an a-hole. Here, we're no longer dealing with a mere curse, but with the philosophical relationship between mind, soul, and body, which the body-soul disconnect that we see in this film makes us ponder. In the book Women and Images of Men in Cinema, an excellent and thorough examination of the 1946 Beauty and the Beast in terms of gender and psychology, German psychoanalyst and film critic Andreas Hamburger writes, The lasting contradiction between the inner goodness and the frightening features of the monster which make La Belle tremble, is resolved within the tale and the film by the power of thought, which transcends the ephemeral body in favor of the substantial good heart within. At this point, we plunge into the film's more adult artistic side, looking at its Freudian exploration of female desire. Roger Ebert writes of the film's rich psychological subtext in his review. Some will be put off by the black and white photography and the subtitles, brief, however, and easy to read. Those who get beyond those hurdles will find a film that may involve them much more deeply than the Disney cartoon, because it is not just a jolly comic musical, but deals, as all fairy tales do, with what we truly dread and desire. Brighter and more curious children will be able to enjoy it very much, I suspect, although if they return as adults, they may be amazed by how much more is there. Much has been said about the male gaze in cinema, but it seems that the female gaze gets much less attention probably because of a shortage of examples. This film is such an example, and an excellent one at that. While Disney spent years of effort trying to make its beast look both horrific and beastly, and yet attractive and pleasant to look at, this film's beast looks truly hideous. Yes, the beast is feline, but he looks not like a cat that you'd want to pet or embrace, but rather like a sick and dying cat, frail and diseased. Yet in the film, he is constantly the object of Belle's attention, of her gaze, if you will. His ugliness, while making him less physically attractive, makes him more fascinating. Keep in mind, while this is a fantasy film and a fairy tale which can be viewed in a more straightforward way, it is also a film made by a surrealist, filled to the brim with symbolism. Therefore, much of the film makes more sense when you begin to read the film as a dream, as the fantasy of Belle's subconscious a fantasy in which she's whisked away from her dull everyday life into a dark, mysterious world filled with magic by a dark, mysterious, but gentle prince suffering from a terrible curse, who treats her like royalty and gives her jewels and dresses. At first, he will be too bold, and she will resist his advances. Voulez-vous être ma femme? Non, la bête. But later, she will warm to him, and her love will free him from the curse and transform him into a handsome prince. 
Yes, it's easy to see the beast as the captor here, but interpreting things from a surreal psychoanalytical perspective, Belle, or rather her subconscious, is really in control. Il n'y a ici de maître que vous. Tout ce qui se trouve dans ce château vous appartient. Exprimez au moindre caprice. This is her dream, her fantasy, a fantasy of personal empowerment and emotional fulfillment. Dennis Denito, another film psychoanalyst, describes Beauty and the Beast in very Freudian terms as a story of a young woman's initiation into sexual womanhood by turning away from the sterile, taboo relationship with her father and accepting the reality of man as both romantic lover and sexual husband. The Beast is emotionally the romantic lover, but his appearance is a reminder of the existence of male sexuality. When Beauty ceases to reject the latter, the dual dimensions of the suitor become combined in a prince whose virility is part of his attractiveness. These aren't things that we're supposed to be thinking about while viewing the film, but the sexual undercurrents in the story are there, not between the Beauty and the Beast so much as between what the two of them represent, metaphorically. In a way, Belle's journey could be read as a symbolic representation of a woman's journey in confronting the sexual side of love and reconciling it with the platonic side of love. But the story could also be read platonically as well, as a metaphor for healthy compromise within relationships, of accepting flaws in our partners while working to better ourselves. Note that both characters must do something in order for the curse to be broken. Yes, Belle has to love the beast, but the Beast had to let Belle go in order to earn that love. To not only let Belle literally leave the castle, but to emotionally release her from any obligation to love him back. When we admire someone else, especially when it is to the point of infatuation, we can feel subjugated to the object of our affection, even devalued in comparison to the person that we invest so much of our emotion in. As Petrarch wrote, I love another, and thus I hate myself. Perhaps this is what the beast's curse represents, when a man is so in love with another person that he feels like a beast until he is assured that his love is requited. It makes sense, considering the beast, with his shyness, awkwardness, and consistent subservience, is a perfect picture of this kind of infatuation. Je vous répugne. Vous me trouvez bien laid. In addition to the presence of the goddess Diana in the film, stag-like imagery features prominently, calling to mind the Greek myth in which the goddess Diana transforms the hunter Acteon into a stag because he gazed upon her bathing. If the beast's curse is a metaphor for the shame that comes with desire, then the connection to the Acteon myth merges both the sexual and platonic aspects of that shame and desire. Bell's defining characteristic is her inner goodness, serving her family to the point of being self-effacing and eventually sacrificing herself to save her father. Her continual uprightness also solidifies her position as the dreamer of the story and the character from whose perspective we should process the story's events. Je voudrais un singe. Un perroquet. <laughs> Et toi, Belle, qu'est-ce que je te rapporte Mon père, rapportez-moi une rose. When her father asks his daughters what they would like, her sisters ask for material things, objects of status, a monkey and a parrot. Belle asks for a rose, something that is temporary and frail, but important because of the emotional connection it signifies, just as the film, the maid of fragile fairy tales and the stuff of dreams, has power and significance because of the strong subconscious emotions it contains. This is perhaps why the beast lists his rose as one of his five chief magical possessions, when it is the only one of them which is not shown to possess any visible magical qualities. Its power comes from emotional value, and it is this valuing of the rose that connects Belle and the Beast. Belle is beautiful inside and out, but of the two men in her life, one has a beautiful body and a monstrous heart, while the other has a monstrous body and a beautiful heart. The narrative begins in dissonance and ends in harmony, with the kind-hearted beast becoming a beautiful prince, and Avenon becoming transformed into a monster. But before love can restore things to their rightful place and end the curse of shame, there must be empathy. The beast's castle, with its dark hallways of exquisite desolation, is a perfect portrait of loneliness, and by immersing herself in that environment, Belle gains an understanding for the beast's constant emotional state. 
empathizes with his torment, as do we. The film enchants us with melancholy imagery that could only have its full effect in black and white. Typically, fairy tales should have a more colorful plot, considering their light and whimsical subject matter. But here, the story's themes of isolation and longing require a moody yet passionate aesthetic. Much of this symbolic interpretation may seem somewhat disconnected, but there's a reason for this. This is only a 90-minute film, and yet to probe the complete depths of this story's imagery and mythology would take 10 videos. All I can do here is to give you a sense of the vast ocean of symbolism and complex emotional dynamics present within the film, in the hopes that upon watching it for the first time, or revisiting it, that you might encounter something of that ocean beneath the fairy tale on the surface. It's because of this subconscious power over the audience that not only the film, but the fairy tale itself is retold again and again. Here, YouTube critic Kyle Colgren explains the enduring history of the fable. Howard Ashman called it a tale as old as time because the idea of a beauty falling for a beast is as old as time, or at least as old as the written word. Our oldest known story, the Epic of Gilgamesh, has a love story of sorts between a divine priestess, Shamhat, and a savage wild man, Enkidu, and that idea of a heavenly woman falling for an animalistic man has been repeated and retold for millennia since. Enkidu and Shamhat, Hades and Persephone, Death and the Maiden, Christine and the Phantom of the Opera, and yes, Bella and Edward, are all variants on Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast has rightly been critically acclaimed as a masterpiece. At the time, the New York Times described it as an eminent model of cinema achievement in the realm of poetic fantasy, a fabric of gorgeous visual metaphors, of undulating movements and rhythmic pace, of hypnotic sounds and music, of casually congealing ideas, Freudian or metaphysician, you can take from it what you will. The concepts are so ingenious that they're probably apt to any rationale from the long corridor of candelabra, held out from the walls by living arms, through which the wandering visitor enters the Palace of the Beast, to the glittering Temple of Diana, wherein the mystery of the Beast is revealed. The visual progression of the fable into a dream world casts its unpredictable spell. After all that's been said, it's difficult to add to all the praise that's been heaped upon the film's visuals. Still, though, I'd like to take a moment to dismiss any last temptations you might have to look at the film as merely a relic of the past, to be afraid that the film will be too old, too French, or too arsy to be enjoyed. In response to that, I refer to the introduction director Jean Cocteau has placed at the beginning of the film, where he writes, Children believe what we tell them. They have complete faith in us. I ask you of a little of this childlike sympathy. He is not asking us to turn our minds on, but to turn them off, to think like a child, to have fun and enjoy the story. Jean Cocteau was rejected by the elite community of surrealist artists that were working in France at the time, and while those filmmakers were certainly prolific, not a single one of their films was as fondly received by the general public or as well remembered as this film. It remains one of the most important films in French film history, because after the devastation of World War II, it gave audiences hope and joy, and more importantly, it kick-started the French film industry that would within the next few decades give us all of the classics of the French New Wave. This was a film that was not made for the critics or the artists, but for the pleasure of the audience. Yes, so much artistry went into making it, and so much psychological subtext lies beneath, but what makes this film special more than anything is how it is able to bury deep meaning and package it in an appealing format without compromising on the powerful effect that underlying meaning will have on us, leaving us with a film that is just as entertaining and heartwarming as it is awe-inspiring.